Well, good evening. My name is John Padfield. I'm going to let uh, our other panelists introduce themselves. Just want to throw in one disclaimer. If you have, how many in here have watched the show Hunted on TV? Okay, good. The vast majority of you don't need any explanation of what the show is about. I do want to just throw in one disclaimer before we get started. The images from CBS and from a, a few other news sites are all used under fair use doctrine. This is a, a non-commercial panel and hopefully an educational panel. Uh, but I'll, I'll let our speakers introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Mike Cole. I was on Hunted. Uh, I was on the cyber desk. There were uh, three of us there who are all, sorry, uh, we're all sort of hackers in real life. Sure. Uh, Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm the loudest person any of you have ever met. <laughs> but, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, so uh, there were three of us on the cyber desk, myself, Charles DeBarber, and Landon Stewart. I wound up with the gig of GSM phone targeting, which is a skill I picked up uh, working counterterrorism missions in Iraq, one of the big ways that we, uh, we track guys out there. Um, for my day job, I do similar but not exactly the same work for a large metropolitan police department that I'm not allowed to tell you is the NYPD. And uh, I write novels, <laughs> fantasy novels, and science fiction uh, books, which is one of the other reasons why I'm here at DragonCon. And I'm Dave Moss. I am an investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. If you're not familiar with them or us, we are a nonprofit based in San Francisco that defends uh, civil liberties as it intersects with technology. Uh, my role is to uh, hold the police accountable and file lots of public records requests, particularly around police uh, surveillance technologies. And I do uh, work a lot on policy and laws reforming surveillance technology. Um, I hadn't heard of the show until John emailed me asking if I could be on this panel, and he said, watch one or two episodes, you'll get the gist, watch one or two episodes, and then I watched all of the episodes. And so uh, I'm very excited to be here today. I'm really glad that Mike joined uh, a couple days ago. So we're, we got, we got a good panel now. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. My name is John Padfield. I'm a professor at Purdue University, and I run an uh, analytics and innovation consulting company. I'm also a former state representative, which officially makes me a member of the smallest minority in the United States, somebody that understands technology who has held elected office. <laughs> I, I've done some consulting for law enforcement, um, worked with a, a sheriff's department that had a problem with accidental release of inmates. So after guys like Mike would help to lock him up, um, they, they had problems keeping him locked up. For, the, for those of you that are not familiar with the show, Hunted, a uh, very simple premise. Some people have described it as the world's most sophisticated game of hide and seek. Nine teams of two fugitives are given a 100,000 square mile area to go hide. Th that included all of Georgia, all of South Carolina, about the northern third of Florida, and the eastern third of Alabama. They were given a one hour head start before the hunters were notified. The hunters were given their faces, their names, their addresses, and uh, Mike can elaborate on what they did from there. But uh, the incentive for the fugitives, if the fugitive successfully evaded capture for 28 days, the fugitive team would win a quarter of a million dollars. Over the course of the seven episodes of the TV series, seven of the nine fugitive teams were captured. And this is the 14 fugitive, or excuse me, the 14 hunters working out of the command center. They operated from an undisclosed location, but they were the ones that would uh, process the leads. In addition to the 14 people that you see featured there, uh, there were nine two-man teams that were out driving around in black SUVs that were the field operators going to people's homes, looking for any clues they could find, bringing back laptops, cell phones, whatever they could find and then the hunters working out a command center would process that. This is a, a list of the people that were in the command center. Um, I know it's difficult to read from where you are, but uh, when you look through there, you've got a lot of experience on this team. You have former FBI officials, former U.S. Marshals, former British intelligence, uh, quite a, a lot of experience there on that team. Um, Mike, would you like to Oh, uh, Yeah, um, I mean, uh, also, I'd like to point out that the community tends to cross-pollinate uh, in that a lot of us that have these jobs uh, that you see, they're also held other jobs. So, um, for example, like I said, I'm not allowed to tell you where I work, so my department was really insistent that that not be mentioned on the show, so they just tagged me as former military cyber expert. But the, tru <laughs> but the truth is, um, I, I come out of years in federal intelligence at Defense Intelligence Agency. Steve and I worked 
both at the Office of Naval Intelligence. Um, and you'll see that a lot of the people that are listed there, you know, this is the last job they held or the job that CBS felt would be most appropriate to the tagline. But you'll find that there's a ton of cross-pollination in the experience of, of these folks on the show. One of the things that I found most interesting when I started watching the show, and I, I didn't watch it in real time when it was being broadcast from January through March of this year, about uh, late March of this year, after it had already been released on iTunes, I binged watched the entire show. When I first started watching, the very first thought that went through my mind is, how on earth are they doing this legally? Because these are not real fugitives, but it appears like they have access to technology that only real law enforcement would have access to. The answer is in the show itself. If you watch the show through the credits, you'll see this statement at the end. While the investigative techniques shown in Hunted are real, some procedures have been replicated for broadcast, which simply means without proper warrants and court orders, they could not do some of the things that it appeared they were doing on screen, but they had some workarounds to simulate that, and Mike may be able to elaborate on that a bit. Just one last uh, thought about how real is it. Watching the show at a certain level, if you're not paying a lot of attention, it looks very real when you see the hunters operating in an office environment. But if you, again, pay attention to the credits at the end of the show, you see things like prop maker foreman, the art director, the set director, the costume designers, kind of a clue that maybe it wasn't quite as authentic as what it appeared on TV. Um, I do want to look, I, I, I want to make sure I'm not, I have no relationship with CBS anymore, so I have no incentive to be nice to them. Um, I do want to say this, CBS was dead set on making this show as real as humanly possible. They were not screwing around. Now they had to notionalize a lot of stuff. And we did have a costume designer. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, uh, what they had me do was send photographs of the clothes I normally wear before I came out there. And then they replicated it, but tweaked slightly for television. So for example, that shirt I was wearing that I wore every day for 28 days um, <laughs> was about 15 sizes too small. And I remember like <laughs> literally needing a shoehorn and a you know, family sized jar of petroleum jelly to get this thing on. <laughs> And then I'm standing there being like, hey, my navel is showing. This maybe is more appropriate to your eight-year-old son. And the, <laughs> the costume designer said, no, you, you look great. That's what you're going to wear. Um, so but my point being is that what they tried to do was you know, tweak the drama just a little bit, but we still were ourselves. Um, and the same is true of the law enforcement processes that you see represented here, is that certain things had to be notionalized, correct. But they were notionalized in such a way that they accurately reproduced the genuine process, right? So that, um, and a perfect example, uh, I'll give an example of this is, um, you know, obviously we don't have access to every ATM camera in the United States the way we would if we were in law enforcement. You understand the process in law enforcement. We would subpoena camera footage, right, from Bank of America, whatever it's involved in a fugitive manhunt. And there is legal mechanisms and technical mechanisms in place for law enforcement departments to get that information back. Obviously you can't do that when you're making a television show. So you have production crews that simulate this, right? And they'll either use a GoPro or they'll use some other means to create that camera feed for us. But we, the hunt team, that are, are still have to go through the exact same legal process. And CBS has a team of lawyers that are authentically and exactly replicating the court and legal system that we would have to go through to get this footage. So the time delay you're seeing, the amount of ju legal justification and wrangling and back and forth you're seeing is an accurate simulation of what you're seeing in law enforcement. Now CBS, I believe, made the decision they didn't want to break the fourth wall for the audience, right? They wanted you to be lost in the, um, in the, uh, you know, in the magic of what you were experiencing and it, 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 it being real. So they didn't want to turn to you and say, you know, this is what we're actually doing to make it, to make it move. But I do want to say in CBS's defense that uh, they were not playing around and that at least from my experience, there was very little difference in the effort I had to put in in my real life in counterterrorism targeting and law enforcement than I did to, uh, to do things on the show. So a buffer team. <laughs> a buffer, a buffer? buffer between your real and their. Yeah, uh, I'll give you another example that people always bring up. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to dump No, 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 no right, go for it. Right so people always said, people, it made me insane. People always said, why didn't you target the camera crews, right? Every one of these fugitives is running around with like 20 <laughs> people with boom mics and cat. Like, why don't you just target them? Um, and the answer is, is that CBS has a massive, this is a, look, this is a game show with a lot of money at stake. 
and CBS cannot run the risk of breaking the rules because then they take on a massive legal and financial liability. They have a huge department called Standards of Practices, CBS Standards and Practices, s &P. These guys are everywhere. They are all over you. They are lawyers that do nothing but this all day long. So when people are calling into our tip line saying, hey, there's a camera crew on my street, those calls are being intercepted and stopped. And when I start targeting one of the production assistant's phones because of common contacts I'm getting when I dump cell towers, Someone jumps on my back off camera and says, drop that number. You're not going after it, right? So they really were aggressive about keeping, um, keeping the playing field sanitized. Like, th it was, there was very, very, I would say, actually say there was no opportunity for us to, uh, to uh, circumvent what would be the normal process in real life. Can, can I ask you a question? So, uh, you know, one of the, the questions that, that people keep asking who I show the show to is why didn't the fugitives steal cars or why didn't they find a car that looked similar and swap the plates? Was there a restriction on the fugitives to not actually do illegal things to escape the, uh, so the, the truth, fugitives? So the truth is I don't know the answer to that because that's a ground. So I'm in the command center, okay. so I wasn't dealing with what uh, the ground restrictions are. We were not, again, CBS put a lot of effort into making sure that we on the command center we're acting like this is a real law enforcement scenario. So we were ready for shooting, we were ready for car chases, whatever it was. Um, I, I am going to guess here, and this is just my opinion, that of course they were told you cannot break the law. Okay. Um, I, know, I know there were no-go zones, I, I do know that, uh, where they weren't supposed to go. Um, I'm not really sure what the driving mechanisms were behind it, but yeah. I, I will throw in that th there was one of the fugitives uh, I've had some conversations with who was planning on being here uh, personal situations came up. They were not a lot, not able to be here. But the fugitive that I talked to prior to tonight told me that uh, he and his partner had done several things to throw the hunters off. If you watch the show, there was one set of fugitives, the first set of fugitives captured. They did an ATM withdrawal at a bus station, turned around and bought a bus yeah. ticket, and the hunters were waiting for them when they got off the bus. Yeah, Big surprise. Bad. Don't do that. If you're on the run, don't do that. <laughs> Well, this, this fugitive and his partner, they had gone to a bus station as well, bought a ticket, did not get on the bus, and took off in another direction. And he said that he heard later that that was a very expensive uh, incident for CBS because they had hunters waiting at the other end of the bus. <laughs> they did it again with a train station. They did it again with a, a rental car. They, they did it numerous times. One of their diversions made it on television. Several other diversions just didn't uh, didn't make the final cut because there were nine fugitive teams and only seven episodes, so you can only pack in so much. Hey, I just want to say that the fugitive he's talking about is a guy named David Winditcher and his, uh, I believe, fiance now, Emily Cox. Um, I'm really disappointed I didn't get to meet David, uh, who's going to be here tonight. David is an amazing man, uh, and I just want to point out two things about him. One is that he is a former career criminal who completely turned his life around and became a lawyer. And while he could have gone into the, a more lucrative field like corporate law, instead he dedicated his life to a project he runs called Project Red, where he provides um, pro bono representation to inmates, because these are people who cannot get legal defense when, they're, when uh, things are done wrong to them. He's, he's a pretty amazing guy, and I encourage people to, to uh, Google him and, and read about his life. And talk about some of the tech now? Absolutely. Oh, exciting. <laughs> Watching the show, I'm, I started making a list of the technology featured in the show, and this is in no particular order, but obviously the cell phone intercepts, location data, as well as content data. There were some episodes in the show where actual conversations were being listened in on. Social media hacking played a major role. Uh, guessing someone's reset uh, question so that you could reset their password and gain access to their email account. Uh, computer forensics. If uh, somebody left a laptop in their home when the hunters went in, that came back so that uh, you could look at internet search histories find out where they were looking, were they buying backpacks, were they tr mapping out uh, trails of uh, woods nearby, something like that. Uh, so th this is a, a list of the major uh, technologies. I highlighted two of them in red, automatic license plate readers and facial recognition. Uh, Dave and I have spoken on these topics in past Dragon Con, so I just highlighted that, that those technologies are pretty amazing technologies, but they are just a, a part of the overall uh, surveillance fabric out there that's available as tools to law enforcement. 
Oh, so I would love to talk about license plate readers and facial recognition. So one of the things I found fascinating with the show is how obsessed the fugitives were with facial recognition. Like they were under the impression that if you cover your face, you got to cover your face every time there's a camera because that's what's going to give them away. And time and time again, they were nailed by license plate readers. License plate readers, to me, are one of the number one threats to our privacy. They are cameras, you know, just like they say in the show, these cameras are everywhere. They have them up and down all the freeways. They know when you're going to leave the freeway. They, well, they know when they leave the freeway. They know when you get on the freeway, and they can, you know, you know they, they're able to, to, to create tr you know, records of your travel patterns, um, whereas facial recognition really isn't quite like that. I think facial recognition only maybe comes up once in the show, and actually I thought it was used in a similar way that I've seen law enforcement use it, where it's more about confirming the identity of somebody, not using them to track them. I think that they basically knew who they were looking at in the ATM video, because otherwise they wouldn't have that ATM footage. <laughs> but I imagine that for these like behind-the-scenes legal processes, they had to use facial recognition to show a positive confirmation so they could get whatever legal process they needed to go further. But it was license plate readers over and over and over again um, I think one of the most interesting sequences is with um, there was a, a, a couple of women who had done very well staying out of the uh, of, of sight for a while. Two in Central? Yeah, okay. and they got very hungry, and so they get on the road and it's go to Taco Bell, and the sequence is, you know, the the police see them get ca caught on a license plate reader camera on the freeway. They see that they don't get caught on the next camera, so they're able to extrapolate that this is the exit they might have gotten off on. And then, uh, you know, so the uh, the team that's on the ground gets off of that exit and they, you know, properly uh, rationalize that they're probably hungry, and so they go to the nearest food place there, and sure enough, they're parked eating tacos. Um, <laughs> I've heard from a friend of a friend of them that perhaps had the uh, the hunters search social media a bit more, they would have also found that these people are huge Taco Bell fans, yep. um, and that would have further limited it. Um, and, the, you know, a huge mistake, they probably wouldn't have gotten caught if they'd gotten, drove somewhere else to eat their Taco Bell rather than in the parking yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, but I, I find that fascinating, and I think that I was saying on a panel earlier that I think facial recognition maybe one day become like license plate readers, where they are able to track you by your face across cameras. We're not quite there yet, and so if I was on the show, I would be a lot less concerned with covering my face and more concerned about switching vehicles as much as possible. Sure, sure. I, I would just throw in one other thing about the automatic license plate readers. One of the biggest legal debates about license plate readers is how long do you keep the data because I personally have no problem with a camera being out along the interstate so that if a judge signs a warrant saying we're looking for so-and-so this is their license plate if that car drives by somebody like Mike gets a notice of the person you're looking for is here what I have a problem with is here's every car that's driven by this location for the last six years with a timestamp on it so if I want to start piecing someone's life together uh, I can start going to all of these cameras. I've got a problem with keeping that type of data just as a permanent record. It's Coupled, a, oh, go, go ahead, one, sure. One thing that I want to add to what John is saying that everyone needs to be concerned about, about data retention, is, is the security of that data when it's retained. So for example, the Chinese government has my SF-86. When I receive my top secret clearance. Wait, what's the SF-86 here? The SF-86 is the full background questionnaire for that anyone who goes into the intelligence community fills out in order to get their <laughs> 50 pages worth. In order to get their, um, in order to get their, I feel like I should beat Bob. <laughs> Sorry, I just a uh, dramatic effect. I don't want anybody to miss my tattoos. So, um, uh, so um, the reason that the Chinese government has this information, my full background, and we're talking everywhere I've been, everyone I know, everything I've ever done wrong, uh, any kind of indiscretion I've had in my life which has to be disclosed, embarrassing stuff. I've done some really, really awful things. Um, just kidding. Uh, they have that because while the federal government was able to retain that data, demand it from me, and then retain it. They don't have the cybersecurity chops to keep it secure. And if OPM, the federal government, can't do that, do you think the state of Georgia can? Do you think the local municipality, the Athens Police Department, is going to keep your license plate data safe? No, they're not. They can't. Um, and we have historically low levels of cybersecurity investment. So one of the things that I do personally is that when people ask me for data of any kind, be it a hotel, an airline, whatever it is, my first answer is always no. What do you need it for? 
Um, and then I have to make the painful decision, is it going to cost me my ability to get a room? Is it going to cost me the ability to get on this flight, right? And if it isn't, if it, if it isn't, it's worth being a pain in the ass. People want to go along to get along in society. We, we don't want to be difficult, especially with people who are just doing their jobs. But every time someone in a hotel or in a train station or any kind of area asks you for your phone number, your social security number, your date of birth, any piece of data that they are going to store electronically, you need to be thinking about how that data is going to be retained and secured. Because it does not take a lot. We always say hacking, it's like this, you know, numinous, you know, high-level skill thing, you know, it's very difficult to hack. It's not. It's actually kind of easy. And with a Google search, you can learn a lot of exploits. So please keep that in mind when you, when you consider uh, things like LPR data being stored. Oh, okay. Oh. So another, another technology that I found really that was like maybe the first thing that came up that I was like, oh, I need, to, I need to put in some public records requests about this. I need to figure out what's going on here, is how they were able to... Uh, uh, identify when somebody was using a burner phone and look at the metadata between calls to identify that that well this person has switched phones but we can still figure out who they are and one of the programs that EFF has been looking at for a few years now is something called uh, well it was originally called uh, uh, Hudson Hawk uh, named after the uh, the Bruce Willis movie that nobody remembers except maybe a few <laughs> law enforcement officers in Houston um, it later become Hemisphere, and now it's got such a generic title that I don't even recall what it is. I'm trying to like look it up so I can tell you that it's something, something, intrusion system or something. But what this is is that AT&T has a partnership with law enforcement in three jurisdictions, in Los Angeles, Houston, and here in Atlanta. And they actually have a contract where they have AT&T analysts who receive uh, some sort of security clearance, and cops are able to go to them and have them search not only AT&T's records, but any calls that went through AT&T's uh, switching relay. And that allows them to use like you know uh, algorithms to, to try to figure out not just you know, like what kind of, you know, so you switch to a burner phone to see what kind of calls uh, were within that network to identify you. And that's something that you guys used a lot to, to, to you know, because people would, you know, one of the first things they would do is drop their, like they would just leave their old cell phone at home and then they would go buy a burner phone or they would use a neighbor's phone or a family member's phone or somebody they met. People would ask like random people on the street, can I use your phone? Which they probably wouldn't have been able to use if there wasn't a camera <laughs> crew and like make them look legit. But, I mean, there's, there's, but, there's a simpler way, there's a simpler shoe leather way, which is, is that in real regions of the United States and around the world, there's usually one or two manufacturer vendors of burner phones, period. Yeah. So all I have to do is subpoena everyone in a radius of the last location that they jumped from, and what are your sales? People aren't buying burner phones every five minutes, yeah. you know, and that can narrow it down very quickly. The other thing we can do is that most of the times um, where you buy a burner phone, you're buying it at a drugstore or something like that, and there's an electronic point of sale system, and that electronic point of sale system has receipts. So I can go and say, hey, you know, what are your sales? Uh, let me see what you, you know, I know this person was in this location between these hours and this radius. What was sold at these vendors in that period of time? And a lot of times that shoe leather method of just going through until you find the purchase is especially doubly effective if we have a credit card number or a bank number or card number that we know of. I want to go back for just a second to the uh, license plate readers, finish off a thought on that. I mentioned this is one of the biggest controversies right now. Several states have introduced legislation to try and limit the length of time the information can be stored from a license plate reader. The most common number thrown out is 30 days. Some states are looking at 60 day limits. Laws vary state by state as far as what the states are allowed to keep. There is another threat to privacy that is not government. Private companies have automatic license plate readers as well. There is a company in Texas they sell a kit, they primarily target uh, tow trucks, and the, the business model looks like this. If you own a tow truck business, buy a camera from me, and then if somebody buys a car from Fifth Third and they quit making payments on it, Fifth Third can contact me, the owner of this business, and tell me what, uh, what's the license plate number of the car that's missing. Then I go out to my network because I may have 500 tow trucks running around the country, with license plate readers gobbling up license plates, GPS coordinates, and timestamps. And I can see that the car that Fifth Third is looking for has been spotted five times in Minneapolis in this one neighborhood. Well, that gives me a real quick place to start focusing. The incentive for the tow truck driver to buy my, my camera system is if there is a reward out for picking up that uh, car that Fifth Third wants back, that tow truck driver is first in line to get the job of going and picking up the car and uh, getting some money off of that. 
but there is absolutely no legislation right now that I'm aware of in any of the states that limits how long private companies can uh, hang on. Arkansas to the banned it. Ar they did. Yeah, okay. yeah private, I was not private aware company, of that. Yeah, they can't. Private companies cannot collect license plate reader. You cannot do be a private license plate reader company in Arkansas. One down, forty nine to go. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and Utah also passed something, but there was a lawsuit that that kind of negated it, and that's kind of in flux. I would add on to that that there's um, a company in particular called Vigilant Solutions that has a massive, massive, you know, billions of records that they collect through the same means. Um, but what they do is they will sell that to debt collectors, uh, the, the data debt collectors, to uh, insurance companies, to banks. And so the idea is if you're an insurance company, you could actually run somebody's plates and see all the places that they go to assess risk on them. If you're going to give a car loan to somebody, you can see whether, you know, this, you know, if this person's true about where they work or, you know, look up their habits. Um, and then same thing if, you know, debt collectors want to track you down, they can put it in the system and then get real-time alerts on where you are so they can go find you, repossess your car, do whatever they're going to do to you. I, I'm sure divorce lawyers have never even thought about this. <laughs> is, is anyone in the audience a private investigator or has done investigative work of some kind? Okay, so how many people here have heard of LexisNexis? ChoicePoint, Accurant, Spokio, anybody heard of that? So these are open source publicly available, publicly available search engines that function not all that differently from investigative tools that I use in, in law enforcement and in the intelligence community. And if you can pay for them, you can use them, period. And they contain unspeakable amounts of data about every single person in this room, dates of birth, family members, residences, uh, purchase histories, past criminal histories, past traffic histories. The United States is pretty unprecedented, at least in the Western world, in the amount of um, bl blurring between private and public roles in terms of those investigative capacities. And if there's one thing that I, I know EFF pushes really hard to do, and I hope people will take away from this panel, is, is that realization. A lot of us sort of go through our lives not understanding. We think that these kinds of investigative roles are uh, held by the government exclusively, and they're not, not remotely. In fact, my first two tours in Iraq, my, my entrance into the intelligence community was as an employee of the, of the Mantec Corporation and then the Khaki Corporation. I was a mercenary. It's a night where we call it a private military. It's a mercenary. It's a private company. I didn't have any special government authority, and in that capacity, I was able to be an intelligence targeter and an interrogator as a private citizen, member of a private company, and they are very impressed about that out there. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want people, as you, as you listen to these gentlemen talk, to really be keeping in mind that um, there really is very, very thin line between the government and the private sector in terms of investigative authority and the ability to both collect and retain data on you. I'll just throw out one thing. Uh, Mike mentioned Spokio and PeopleFinder, and th there's a number of data aggregators out there one step in the right direction is a, a service called deleteme.com, excuse me, abine.com, A-B-I-N-E.com. They offer a service about 120 bucks a year called Delete Me, where they will go out and purge you from many of these websites. Uh, they don't make a claim of doing every one of them because there's so many, but uh, the major ones like Spokio, Intellius, PeopleFinder, they will uh, file the paperwork to get you deleted from their system. You have to do it about a quarterly basis because you keep getting added back in. But uh, there is a mechanism for purging yourself out of some of those databases. But I would never fool myself into thinking it was going to take care of everything. Um, I'm just looking at your list and thinking of which ones I can talk about more. Uh, drones. The drones make an appearance in it. I think it's uh, in a sequence where, correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, but where uh, some of the fugitives were trying to escape on a boat, right. and they launched a and they launched a, a drone to try to identify who was in the boat. Um, that is actually you know pretty consistent with how we see law enforcement use drones in in uh, emergency situations and situations where they can't uh, physically go themselves or it's too dangerous to go close. In this case, getting uh, you know over boats is not like they can just like run to the boats because you have to go and find another boat to get them. Um, uh, what's interesting though is that in certain states they wouldn't have been able to do it like they did it. Um, so Virginia requires a warrant for a drone and so you would have had to have gone and got a warrant in advance and so you wouldn't have known um, at the point that they knew that they were getting on a boat. They just wouldn't have had access to a drone and unless there was an immediate threat to human life which there didn't seem to be in that sequence, um, they wouldn't have been able to do it. So they would have had to, you know, that, that would have foiled them if they had been in Virginia at that time. Which the show didn't go to Virginia, so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter. 
Well, before we open up to questions, I, I want to just throw in one other thing. I, I was a big fan of the show, enjoyed watching it from, uh, I think it was January 22nd to March 1st when it aired in the U.S. Uh, I watched it just after that, binge watching it. There was a bad incident that occurred about two weeks after the show concluded. It had nothing to do with the show, but uh, this incident occurred for real, in real life. Mid March of this year, a 50 year old high school teacher in Tennessee took off with a 15 year old female student. They were on the run for 38 days before they were captured. And when you look close at what happened, uh, within a day or so, you know, the, the girl doesn't come home from school. They find out that a friend of hers had dropped her off at a gas station. Um, the teacher disappears about the same time. Law enforcement starts putting the picture together. They uh, have a video surveillance from a gas station of the guy filling up his car about a block away from where the girl was dropped off. They figure out pretty quickly that the two of them took off together. 38 days later and over 2,600 miles away from where it started, uh, they were captured in Northern California. And after having just watched Hunted and realizing there's license plate readers, there's social media, there's everything else, uh, I'm sure a lot of people were wondering, well, what took so long? The, the hunters were able to pick up seven out of nine fugitive teams really quickly. How did this uh, pair get away when uh, they, they weren't even necessarily cooperating? We, we don't know all of the details about the 15-year-old, uh, the but this guy managed to stay on the run for 38 days. And I think a part of it comes down to this. They were picked up on store cameras at Walmart. They were picked up on automatic license plate readers. So that technology was out there. What they didn't have was teams of black SUVs running around in the vicinity right. ready to respond immediately. The other thing is the, the double-edged sword of publicity. Eventually they were caught because somebody in California recognized the, the pair of them and made a call to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations. But because of the national attention, I highlighted in, in the red box there, this is a story that was published in late March. It said there had been 1,100 prior tips to authorities, but none were credible. So there was a tremendous amount of bad information coming in of suspected sightings. There was an older man and a younger girl at this location. That's sucking up law enforcement resources, chasing down false leads. Um, can I ask you another question, Mike? Of course. Okay. So uh, one of the, the the fugitive teams started off with this, this – um, this plan they had where they were going to uh, they sent out letters to a whole bunch of different people like all their family members giving them a password to log into right. a Gmail account and they all got the same password it's even a different this password is, this is Hilmar and Lee yeah. he's talking about yeah. I, 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 I don't were one, of, one of the teams that, that yeah. won yeah. yeah they did win but this was I thought was was fairly ridiculous and I want your thoughts on yeah. it so the so the first thing is they sent everybody the identical letter with the same password to log into this email account um, and they were going to communicate in draft folders. And it struck me like, number one, uh, that's how General Petraeus was caught uh, with draft <laughs> folders. So if it's not going to work for him, I don't know why it's going to work for this you know, reality TV show competitor. But number two, if they're sending out the same password to 15 different people, that's 15 different people that you can exploit. And if one person gives it in, you've undone the whole network. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether there was anything to ground his 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 concept that this might work. So it is. So there's a term here called TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And when you you will get a lot of people in law enforcement, the military, and intelligence who get very upset when people like me go on on television and talk about TTPs, right? Because they feel that we're giving the bad guys, so to speak, information they can use to defeat us down the road. And that's a bullshit argument. And it's a bullshit argument because bad guys aren't stupid. And because all of the TTPs, if a TTP is not in classified channels, it's on Wikipedia, and anybody can learn about it. So I just want to defeat that argument right off the bat because I do get a lot of shit from um, uh, from folks in the field that you're revealing TTPs, and my response is always, "You must think criminals are a lot dumber than you than uh, than you than uh, than they actually are." So what's what 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 you're describing here is called an electronic dead drop, and it is a time-honored TTP that is about as old as email. And the reason that people do it, you're right, if law enforcement or intelligence has access to an email account, it's not going to do you much good because we do look in the drafts folder. 
Um, but what it does do is it keeps message traffic out of the MTA or message transfer agent. Email systems have what's called an information store, which is where your email sits. You know, when you're reading it, your client is viewing information in this database. When you send an email or are receiving an, an email, an electronic entity called a message transfer agent or MTA is then moving that message. And that MTA is a thing that can be accessed. And this, this concept of having more places to look is, is called surface area. Good criminals and good terrorists reduce their surface, targetable surface area. So obviously, I want you to send your emails. It's more places I can look, right? So Lee and Hilmar, in this case, were smart in that they were using a, a known TTP. And I think they found out about it by actually researching it on the internet. But you're right. If we have access to your email account, and we did, uh, you know, we're just going to see all of these draft folders. And every time someone logs on to the account from whatever password, well, now we have an IP address. That IP address is going to correlate to an edge router, which is going to correlate to a location. And then we can track that back to a person. Didn't you scan their mail? So you you're talking about their physical mail. Yeah, okay. yeah. Can you, right. What about so that? This is another one. So this is, called, this is called a mail cover. And again, I got so much heat from cops being like, I can't believe you told the world about mail covers. And I'm like, well, I can't believe people with access to Google couldn't just type in mail cover and read that. Um, so yes, there's a thing called mail covers. We do scan in the United States every piece of mail that's sent everywhere. I, I was surprised when I saw it on the show. I was aware that it existed. I didn't know the name, but I knew that that existed. When it was mentioned on the show, I was surprised that it was mentioned publicly. So I did go out and Google it, and I found out that the FBI acknowledged it about 2013. They did a press release about it. So it's not a secret when the FBI is doing a press release. Right. So this is, this is, this is what I'm talking about is that um, – and I do want to say that uh, one of the – at least my attitude, at least in law enforcement intelligence, is that the public is not stupid. And you do not I improve relationships between intelligence and police and the public and man do we need to improve those relationships now because they're in a bad bad place by treating the public like they're stupid and keeping secrets from them because when you treat the public like they're stupid and you keep secrets from them the public hates you and they think that you're up to no good and frankly a lot of the times they're right so I as someone who's in law enforcement I know there's a concept in Pelian policing we call it policing by consent and I'll give the example of the city of New York there are 9 million people in New York there's about 55,000 people in the NYPD. If 9 million people don't want 55,000 people to tell them what to do, we can't, no matter what guns we have. We must have cooperation from the public to do our jobs. We must. And in order to have that cooperation, we have to be willing to engage with the public about these kinds of facts. So I get very frustrated on this TTP argument. Well, tell them about these things that they could find out in a Google search. Um, I really think that that's a bad move. And I am hopeful, and one of the things I was so happy about, both with Hunted and the efforts of the EFF, is to bridge that gap and bring you guys into the conversation. I, I could not agree more with what Mike just said. There's a book that I would recommend called The Rise of the Warrior Cop. It's a fascinating book, but it looks at the history of law enforcement. The first police department in the United States was New York Police Department, which started in the 1840s, I believe. We became a country in 1776. What did we do for 70-some years before we, the first police department was created? Duels. <laughs> what well, wasn't duels. But uh, the, the idea of policing by consent, there's a lot to that. And uh, I won't spoil it for you. I, I highly recommend the book because it's very informative about the history of law enforcement and what did we have before we had police forces because as a country we existed for 70 years before the first police department was formed. Um, and th there's a sort of national movement around this uh, concept of uh, the term for it is CCOPS. It's we say C cops because it sounds fun. Um, and it's a model legislation developed by the ACLU. Uh, C cop stands for community controlled. Uh, I'm also very tired, so I'm not for uh, community control of police surveillance. Right. Um, and the idea is, is that if the police are going to obtain surveillance technology, they need to go to the city council, they need to go to the board of supervisors or the county commissioners or to the you know the legislature and get uh, a, through a public hearing and through developing policies get approval from our elected bodies before they start deploying this stuff because too often what we see are police departments acquiring you know what are military class surveillance technologies through you know back channels whether that's um, receiving money through asset forfeiture which you know functions as a slush fund for them and then purchasing it without any policies any discussion or anything like that 
and then suddenly we find out years later that it's been in effect for you know two, three, five years only because somebody happened to discover it in a criminal case or somebody filed a public records request and unexpectedly found out about it. Right. I'd like to uh, go to questions from the audience. I have been notified, though, that this room needs to be empty at 8 o'clock. And so uh, the, the panel is supposed to run until 8. When the panel ends, we're going to have to vacate the room very quickly. So if you want to talk to any of us afterwards, you're going to have to catch us out in the hall. But uh, Scott uh, asked me to pass that message along. We need to get out of here at 8. Oh, oh hold on, there, on a second. There. Oh, Hello. Okay. The mail covers um, <laughs> that you were talking about, is that the one that's done by the post office? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. For anybody that doesn't know, you can go on the post office website and get an email every morning of the mail that's coming to your house that day. Yep. So. Did not know that. Yep. For the license plate readers, are those funded by the federal government? Are they state funded? You've got the private ones too, right. but the so government funded this ones. This totally depends. Uh, the, so the question for those, he's, he's asking about sources of funding. So I can only speak for the police departments I've been involved with, and I do know it varies by municipality, but um, police departments have their own municipal funding, which they're getting, but there are also state and federal grants. Um, and most of these, so for example, the most common federal grants you're going to get are counterterrorism funding funded grants, where there are discrete grants that either fund for a year or a one-time fee, and you make a justification that there's a nexus to protecting your particular municipality from a specific terrorist threat to uh, to get that funding. If you Google police grant funding, you will see all kinds of grants that are available, and they happen at, at every possible level, including private grants from uh, business people and. Uh, wealthier members of the community who want to who want to help uh, help law enforcement with specific missions that they're concerned with. Yeah, this is this is something I know a lot about because you know while police uh, may uh, hide their their practices or their procedures or the things they use, it's very very difficult to hide the money trail. It's very difficult to hide contracts and purchases. Um, and I think this is one of the most the grossest things about license plate readers. So things we see are asset forfeiture money being used. We see the grants being used. We see private police foundations uh, uh, soliciting money from like corporations and then buying it for agencies. But then you have companies like Vigilant Solutions that I go back to that have two other models. One is that they'll give it to law enforcement for free uh, on a sort of weird drug deal drug dealer model get where hooked, yeah, yeah get, get you hooked after three months and then maybe you purchase it there because you can't do without it. But one of the things we've seen in Texas is Vigilant Solutions will come into an agency and say, hey, you've got a lot of outstanding court fees. You've got a lot of outstanding warrants for people who, who, uh, who owe you money. We're going to give you license plate readers and we're going to give you credit card readers for free. And all you have to do is put these on your car and you'll get alerted by any time somebody owes the court money. And you pull them over, you give them a choice, go to jail or pay your fee right now on our credit card reader and the company gets a 25% markup uh, on the fee. So if, you, if somebody owes $400 and they haven't paid it because they don't have any money to begin with, uh, they're going to be paying $500 with $100 going into this company with the police never paying a dime for it. True story. Is there a way? Is there, <laughs> is there a way to defeat the reader? Is there a way to defeat the reader? Is the question. Yeah. Um, th this is one where I actually, y if I did know the answer, I wouldn't tell you. Yeah. Um, I definitely am not going to going to disclose technical ways to defeat a license plate reader. Um, I would say that it's. Is there a way? Is your question? I will, say, I will say this. There is no technology, period, in any, in any arena that cannot be defeated, period. Right. So I will say I, I, I do not work for law enforcement, so I can tell you what I think about this. Um, so uh, you, if you're willing to break the law, then yeah. I mean, you can easily just take off your plate and drive around until you, somebody notices that you have your plate off. You can steal somebody's plate. Don't do this. Don't do this. This is not Just legal advice. Theor theor <laughs> theoretically, if you were a, a actual fugitive, I mean, that would be something. Um, I would say, you know, you know, using public transportation, switching between cabs or, or Uber and doing that on a, on a basis. Like if you, if you are riding uh, ride shares, you know, the ride share is going to know your locations, but license plate readers are not going to be able to have that sort of direct 
connection to it. And the same with like if you take public transportation like buses. And there might be other ways they capture it. But um, there are uh, products out there that have been marketed uh, to uh, uh, cover your plate, to blind readers, to obscure it. In most states that's illegal to do anyways. Um, but it's out there. I can't tell you whether it's effective or not because we don't have the ability to go buy a bunch of license plate readers and test where their weaknesses are. Um, I have this fantasy of like I've thought given a lot of thought like how would you how would you render license plate readers ineffective, and I have this cast of thousands idea where uh, because we've seen we've gotten data from license plate readers through public records requests and we've seen that they don't necessarily reckon, recognize what a license plate is, they recognize what numbers are. And sometimes they will take a picket fence as a license plate that's 11111. Or they will read a stop sign as a license plate of STOP. Or things like that, because it, you know, they're just seeing characters. So if you were to take a community and everybody was to put like your license plate on a piece of paper or something everywhere in the city. It's a good idea for a novel. For yeah, a everywhere in the city, <laughs> yeah. they it would render it effective, ineffective. Or if you were to put up just lots of, of these things all over the place, at some point it would become ineffective for police departments because they wouldn't be able to trust the data at all because it could be a lot of false positives. I don't think that there's a city that I could convince to do this in mass, <laughs> but if we're talking in a science fiction capacity, Great then idea. yeah, you can I'm you can you that. can probably defeat it. Hey, uh, I want to I do want to add on to what David is saying. Um, look, I am all for 1000% for um, law enforcement in general moving because I want law enforcement to be effective and I firmly believe that an improved relationship with the public is the way to do that. I would encourage citizens, um, everyone in hearing my voice, that in your efforts to reform law enforcement, you do it in legal channels. Um, once you break the law, once you move outside legal channels, you have taken a path that is going to limit your effectiveness uh, long term through other means and that um, we, at least for the time being, we're losing it every day it seems, uh, have um, processes where citizens can, through acting through legal channels through their municipalities, with their vote, through protest, even you know active protest, um, can move law enforcement in the direction they want to. So I want, I want to encourage everybody to think about that as an angle. It's slower, it requires more patience, it's a lot more frustrating, um, but I believe that long term it's the effective, most effective way. I actually had a question. What is your take, being in New York, on the fact that I, aren't the toll booths from between New York and New Jersey mitigating the pass only and um, no cash? Well, right. So as everyone knows, uh, I w I'm not allowed to tell you where I'm from. So none of you know where I'm from. So I can't really comment on uh, on how, the, how things do there uh, do there municipally. I, I will tell you. I, I live in Indiana. There are bridges across the Ohio River between Indiana and Kentucky. The first time I drove across the bridge after the new bridge was uh, constructed, I was looking for the toll booth, and there was no toll booth, and I don't have a, one of those easy passes. About two weeks later, I got a letter in the mail, and if you don't have an easy pass on your car, they just mail it to you. Be, they're using the license plate readers. That's, that's the Golden Gate Bridge as well, so, yeah. yeah. The license plate readers, are they typically only on the highways if these people would have gone side roads or is there any way to avoid them? Not that I'm trying to run from them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the ones that are most common are going to be on things like overpasses, on off ramps on interstates. However, there is another type of license plate reader which is mobile. It's mounted on a police car, it's mounted on a tow truck. On a they drone. could be absolute on a drone. Yeah. They could be absolutely anywhere. So your stationary ones are going to tend to be on high traffic roads. So a state highway could have them. Uh, it's probably unlikely you're going to see them on a county road, but the, the mobile ones could be absolutely anywhere. You also have to keep in mind a, a thing we call triangulation. So um, I love when people go on, on the jump in rural areas because I'll give you an example. I, I'll use cell phones because that's mine, but it holds true for license plate readers. There's very few cell towers in a highly rural area, right? And as you move, you toggle between them, right? But since there's so few cell towers, I know you toggle on this one, you toggle on this one an hour later. From that, I can now basically estimate your speed and directionality. So if, if it was an LPR, I'd see your hit off this exit, right? I'd see another hit as you move past a highway where we happen to have one down the road. And now I basically know where you are. So uh, you, I, don't, I, I want to make sure that people understand that just because you're in an area which has less technology in it, law enforcement technology in it, does not make you harder to find. Yeah. So there were two teams that ended up winning. Um, yeah. 
or were there anything that those teams did that were you first of all were you shocked that any teams made it through right and okay so so I want to bring go back to the example that John gave uh, if you want to bring it back up of that uh, uh, older man and, and 15 year old girl who went on the run yeah. um, it is extremely <laughs> unusual to catch seven out of nine teams of fugitives. Um, I did counterterrorism targeting in Iraq for years. That is an unbelievably good record. Um, yeah, I am. I am. I was thrilled that only two teams got away. Um, I I don't really want to say exactly uh, uh, if if any of them did anything special. I do want to say this though that. Um, Law enforcement and counterterrorism targeting, like anything else in the world, is more art than science. And there's a lot of random factors that go into it. And sometimes, I think if, if folks are looking at one of the winning teams, Hilmar and Lee, you guys know that they put a lot of work into it, right? And then you have Steven in English, who are kind of like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> um, and, and just sort of bumbling along. I do want to say this it's a very uncomfortable thing to say, but I'll say it. Um, Steven and English King are white, middle class, skinny people. And when you are white and middle class and look like you just stepped off the floor of a bank, people trust you. And when you walk up to their door and they knock on your door and they say, can we stay in your backyard? People say yes. And I want everyone here to think about what that would have been like if they were African American people from Detroit having that same reaction. Would it have been as easy for them to be on the run? It's a very, very uncomfortable question, but it's, a, it's an important one and one that I, I wish people had considered more when they uh, dissected the show. I feel, I feel like CBS also added an element at the very end that would prevent them from having to shell out like millions and millions and millions of dollars. The At the very end, in order to win, you have to go into a bank to withdraw $250,000 and then you have to go by foot, like by, you know, what, two miles or something to find a plane. And the, few, the, the hunters were no, like, they knew that it would be a plane, so that was already one tip, and they would know when they went to the ATM. And so I have a feeling that had there been six teams getting to that point, CBS may have made it a little easier for the, for the hunters to catch them. I, I, with, respect, with respect, I understand that perception. I do want to reiterate, CBS made this show real. I, I cannot reiterate that enough. Uh, I'm only speaking from my limited perspective as one member of a 36-man member of, of, of that show. But from where I stood, there was absolutely no manipulation of how those results went. What you saw is what happened. Well, okay, so maybe in the end that if there were nine teams running two miles to a, uh, an airplane, um, uh, you guys would have gotten better at catching people <laughs> running from banks to airplanes. <laughs> How did it happen that you got, so to say, permission to use the cell phone towers and the license plate reader data for this show? Right, so um, uh, John had brought this up earlier uh, in CBS's disclaimer. Um, some of these... So I'll say this, in real life, in law enforcement, right, there's a thing called a pen register trap and trace. And what that is is that you, there's a, something called a standard for, we call it DROG, derogatory information, where you can prove to a court that there's bad stuff happening with this phone. And from that, you receive duration of call, directionality of call, phone numbers on either end. From that, if you can establish another pattern of derogatory, you can get a full intercept, a voice intercept of the, you're listening to what people are saying on the call. What I can say is that, Whatever notionalization that CBS did to reproduce that, because obviously we don't have access to actual access to AT&T and Verizon's uh, uh, cell tower information, my experience in going through that legal process was identical. Identical in terms of the hurdles I had to uh, overcome, identical in terms of the legal justification I had to provide, and identical in the amount of time it took for me to receive my data back and the accuracy of the data I received. So from my lens, it was absolutely 1,000% accurate. Um, I, I believe CBS had it notionalized, right? But um, at least in terms of my experience as a hunter, it was, it was uh, accurate to what I've experienced in the real world. Was, was there any technologies that you would have wanted to use that they wouldn't let you use because it would have made it too easy to capture them? No, um, I, no, 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 there were not. I, I think this is going to have to be our last question. Uh, Scott again has asked that we uh, vacate the room by eight o'clock, so but we'll take one more question. How much profit did the show make? They, they had to shell out half a million plus pay all you experts. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, I can't speak to that. I don't know about the, the finances. I will t say that I believe it is the most expensive reality television show ever made. Um, one of the big incentives that networks have to make reality TV is compared to scripted television, it's incredibly cheap. 
um, and Hunted was absolutely the exception of that rule. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out to uh, to this panel. As we leave, folks, as we leave, I really want to reiterate, Electronic Frontiers Foundation, and I say this as a member of law enforcement, is an extremely important nonprofit. Your, um, your freedoms and your rights uh, in the electronic sphere have never been in greater jeopardy than they are now, especially with this administration. And this organization is working tirelessly to protect you. And I would ask that you do the same for yourselves by getting involved with EFF and contributing to EFF as generously as you can afford. Thank you. Uh, we have a table over on this floor over by the escalators, big cardboard TARDIS.